Okay. Uh, Stephen would like to know, do you have any secret to a CW111 spawning? And if you do, will you divulge it, please? <laughs> so uh, I my CW111 are actually spawning weekly right now. So they're, um, they are, uh, I would say they're seasonal. Um, so they're a very interesting fish. There was a lot of doubt when they first came into the hobby um, because the male's dorsal will spike up. And I'm not talking about the spine, you know, like, but the fin itself. Yeah, so, so the spine stays the same size, but the dorsal fin itself will spike up to, I mean, I would say two times to two and a half times its original height. And when wow. that when that male's dorsal spikes up like that, you know it's it's breeding time. You know, so we're actually right now, and I've talked to other hobbyists, uh, Roland Van Oenkirk in in uh, Netherlands, and I think somebody else. We all agreed that like right now seems to be the start. This is the start of their spawning season, and I noticed that the males. The, and I and I have a group. I originally had a group of wild caught, and they just were never right you know so they uh gave me a few spawns um but they i think from either from the handling of them or or something you know from from the place i got them uh they always seemed kind of off a little bit and i eventually kind of lost them all one by one but i was able to get a, a decent amount of of f1s going so i grew i i parted with some groups and i grew a group of about I think I had 12 originally. I'm down to 11 of uh, F1s out, and now they're they're breeding, you know. But uh, you could tell, you know, probably about, you know, I would say April May, you could see the male's dorsal start to grow. And what's interesting is is that now we'll go through this breeding period, and it will it will shrink back down, and that's the crazy part. Because a lot of people said, no way, no way, that's not possible, right? You know, once they develop that long extended dorsal, it's going to stay that way. But, and it's not fin rod, it's not, it's it's like a natural process. So I've seen mm -hmm. it happen myself, and it's bizarre, you know. So that it'll shrink back down to like a standard quarry sized dorsal fin, and then it'll, it'll, you know, pop back up when it's breeding season again. <laughs> you know? So it's really, it's really crazy. It's pretty interesting. Uh, so one thing is obviously watch the time of year, you know, they, I think that they're much more likely to spawn going into the fall, you know, and, and I've had them spawn. I mean, honestly, as, as late as January, you know, like, so they, they, you know, kind of keep going. I've seen, yeah, I, I will say I've seen and heard of people spawning them in March or whatnot, but that could be just, you know, they're doing something else to trigger them or whatnot, you know, but for me, I've always been seen, seen them, you know, late summer through maybe December. That's you know, December, January is, is a good time to try to breed them. Um, I'm keeping them in, I, I will say I'm keeping them in uh, relatively low TDS water. I have them about 125 parts per million TDS, but with my wild caught ones, I kept them even lower than that. It was probably about 90 TDS. So, and I also, um, it's clear water. I'm not really adding any tannins or anything like that. Um, you know, feed them good, feed them live foods. I'm feeding mine uh, baby brine shrimp, occasional live black worms, um, quality, you know, pellets and, and quality flakes right here and there. Um, I do throw in, you know, micro worms and they, the adults go after that still too, you know, so any kind of live foods is, is really good for them. Um, and then just do your, you know, keep your water quality up to your water changes. I do 50% weekly on that tank. Uh, I will say they like to lay eggs on um, like, not, I wouldn't say like fine leaf plants like Java moss. They like a little broader leaf. Uh, I was talking to Ian, his, his were spawning on crypt leaves and mine, mm -hmm. which is crazy, spawn on Valsenaria leaves. And it's pretty funny to watch because it's like they will make a line of eggs along this, you know, <laughs> you know, thing of Val. It's only yeah. Corey, only Corey I've ever seen do that. No, no other Corey uses Val scenario to spawn on. So, yeah. So it's pretty neat to watch that. And then, uh, um, what else can I tell you? Other than that, I think it's, it's, you know, they, they don't seem that difficult to get eggs from. It's more so time of year and good care for getting eggs. Uh, my problem with them has been, uh, fry survival. So uh, my my two best batches that I had were 
when I, I got a batch of eggs, they all hatched out and I keep them in these plastic containers, you know, like a, a specimen container for the first week or so, you know, just to make sure they're eating, make sure that once I get them on baby brine shrimp with Corey's normally, I'm home free, you know. Well, with these ones, that plastic container life, I have no losses. Usually everything's fine, but it's as soon as I move them to a tank and it's not all at once, but it's like, I, I usually put sand substrate in the tanks because I learned early on in my quarry breeding, if you're breeding quarries and you raise the fry on bare bottom or glass, bare glass substrates, their, their lower fins can erode, you know, just simply because of the bacteria buildup on the bare glass. Uh, so my, one of my first ones that I bred was Corridors Meti. I bred, bred them uh, and submitted them to my aquarium society and other people said, oh, I want to buy some, I want to buy some. And I had several people coming back to me, yelling at me saying, I can't breed these fish. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They, they Well, they have no lower fins. The females have no basket to hold the egg. And I looked and said, yeah, sure enough, you know, I, they were right, you know. So, oh. and, and that's from, you know, if you, if you want, if you're desperate to grow them out on a bare, bare substrate or a bare glass substrate, just you're going to have to scrub the glass like all the time, you know, don't, don't let any bacteria build up on there. Cause I think it, it just eats away, especially with the young fish, it eats away at their fins cause they're always sitting on the bottom, you know? So since that time I've used sand, uh, for my quarries pretty much from the time they're nine or 10 days old, you know, I get them on top. So wow. since then, so, uh, but with these CW111s, um, just, just really odd. The best results I've had is, actually setting up like uh, either brand new, meaning, you know, completely cleaned, you know, but brand new sand, brand new tank, brand new sponge filter, and then, you know, move the babies from the specimen container into that. And then I usually have good results. One would think a more established small tank, you know, would be a better idea, right? You know, yeah, yeah. and, and my last uh, batch of them that I tried moving into, I had a, a five gallon tank that I raised, I think it was 65 Aspidorus albata in, right? You know, and I, you know, I cleaned the sponge filter, you know, did several water changes on it. You know, the, sure, the sand had stuff in it, I'm sure, you know, like, but you would think that that would be kind of healthy, you know, an established filter, all that stuff. And I put my last uh, batch of CW11s in that tank and they all, it wasn't right away. So it's not something like, oh, there was an ammonia spike or this happened or this happened, but over time they all passed away. Uh, so my latest attempt, uh, I'm keeping them in a, a floating net breeder instead. So I, as opposed to, so I put that floating net breeder in the parents tank. And again, I'm actually going through every day and uh, using a turkey baster to clean the bottom of the net, net breeder so it doesn't get funky. You know, <laughs> so but so far so good. I haven't had the losses. So I've actually got, I think seven in the net breeder, and then I have about twenty five or so in the plastic, you know, containers still. So uh, I'll continue this experiment and, and we'll see what happens. But so far the net breeder is looking like a good solution that doesn't, you know, make me set up a brand new tank every time I spawn them. So, <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah. Well, so um, there's been a couple of questions that have come up. Um, first thing I'd like to ask, however, is when you say quality flakes or pellets mm -hmm. what are you referring to and sure, not so sure. much the breakdown of the food but sort of what dry foods are you are yeah. you using yeah. so i'm using uh ebo insect which is like a soft mm -hmm. one millimeter granule i uh, got to meet uh the guys that formed that company at the catfish study group and they're really great guys they introduced me to their food gave me some samples and tried it and i i the fish loved it i loved it so i i kept using that um what else am i using so that i use uh new, new life spectrum uh, community flakes so that they, they seem to make a pretty good flake and with quarries obviously it's not the best because uh you know it sits on the top of the water you know so if i if i'm purposefully trying to get quarries to eat it i'll crunch it up in my fingers a little bit put my hand in the tank and you know i've seen some people use uh like ketchup squirters or something like that they could put the crushed flakes in there shake it all up and squirt it in the tank just so you're getting flakes to the bottom of the tank they will eventually fall to the bottom of the tank but yeah i mean flakes aren't the best uh for quarries necessarily um i use freeze-dried uh tube effects worms so those cubes yeah, freeze-dried tube effects worms. 
um, some black worm pellets. I think it's made by Aquatic Foods Inc. And I got those off of Amazon. Uh, so they're, it's just a sinking black worm pellet. Um, mm -hmm. What else do I use? Sarah, uh, use some Sarah um, it, Immune Pro, it's called. So it's yep. Sarah Immune Pro. Um, and then occasionally I use um, PE mysis uh, freshwater pellets so they're they're like a crumble and then um what was sometimes i've tried the the other i can't remember the name of it but it's like another insect one but i remember i fed fed some once and i had some odd losses so i've kind of shied away from that one it's it's out of canada i don't remember the name of the exact food but it wasn't it, yeah it just kind of scared me a little bit i was like eh. i i fed that and then the next day they seemed like they were having gut problems so i was like eh, yeah so um so uh, that for as far as insect stuff now i pretty much use the ebo so yeah cool, cool. um rebecca has seen talking about the extended extended mm -hmm. dorsals is that extended dorsal seasonal and other i'm not even going to try and pronounce that word uh like i'm not pronouncing that one or <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. thank you rebecca yeah so the <laughs> so the i am not in you know you're terribly familiar with uh the odontodes and and hypostomy hypostomy you know so i am uh, I bred some plecos, you know, and I don't, I wouldn't consider myself an expert to know enough, you know, what, what grows and, and, you know, <laughs> fades away on, on plecos, you know, so, uh, the ones plecos that I've bred, you know, as far as odontodes go, I mean, I definitely have seen the males, uh, but I, I wasn't aware that they, uh, would fade away if they were out of season. So uh, I probably, I would guess it's a similar type of reaction, you know, like, but I, you know, I can't speak scientifically to that in, in any way, just, just with my observations. So yeah. cool. and I would say, I would say it's probably akin to breeding coloration more so, you know, so uh, just a, a, as we all know, you know, certain fish can get into like a breeding coloration and that can be affected by seasons as well as conditions and everything else. So I would say it's probably similar to that. So. Cool. 